Okay, good evening, everybody. So as you can see, this is a very different setup than the previous series. I'm not standing with a podium, and I'm doing it on purpose, not because I'm lazy. But I think what I'd like to try to, to create is more of a Hamish atmosphere, an atmosphere where it's real, in-depth, unadulterated, pure learning. I'm very excited about this particular series for a couple of different reasons. First of all, I love the idea of instead of just having a three-part series where each lecture is somewhat dependent on the previous one, this is an ongoing Tuesday night get-together learning Torah and each discussion will be totally independent, totally separate and self-sustaining. So if we miss one here and there, it's not a problem. Come to the next one, a new person will be discussing a new topic. Uh, clearly it can't be every Tuesday night, every single week, things do come up. But I think the plan will be that we'll send an email Monday to verify that we're on. Or we'll send an email Monday if something comes up. I know I'll be going away myself for two weeks in the summer. And we'll send an email to make sure that we know we're off for this Tuesday. But in general, it'll be an ongoing series coming here Tuesday night. Refreshments. Hopefully we'll have more than this next week. It's a little bit meager. And uh, it'll be good. This topic is really one of my favorite topics, which is delving in to people and their ideas. The goal of the series is not to study history. That was a different series. The goal of the series is not to present you with the biography of an individual. The goal is to get a deeper, more sophisticated understanding of Judaism in life. The way we're going to do that, the methodology involved, will be through analyzing individual people. We'll mention some of their background, where they're living, get a little bit of a flavor of who they were in their society. But the point isn't to discuss what they did when they were seven years old and what they did when they were 50 years old and what they did when they were 90 years old. The point is to understand where they were coming from in life, but to focus on their contributions, their writings, their breakthroughs. And seeing how all these great minds somehow contributed to this, this tapestry of Jewish wisdom and Jewish consciousness. That's the goal of the series. We have here booklets. And on page one, the first quote is from Isaiah, probably one of the most famous passages in all of Tanakh and all of the Bible. When he tells us, speaking in the name of God, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and I will hold your hand and keep you, and I will establish you as a covenant of the people for a light unto the nations. That is clearly the goal and the mission of the Jewish nation, is to be a light unto the nations. What we'll be doing in this series is getting into that light, trying to really bring that light into ourselves, understand what that light is, and how to share it with others. To be a light onto the nations. Paul Johnson, who is a great historian and a wonderful author, when he speaks about his desire to write a book on Jewish history, so he tells us that when he's summarizing 4,000 years of Jewish history, we have to ask ourselves a very basic question, which is, what would the world be if the Jews were never here? It's the bottom of page one. He says, if Abraham would have kept his ideas to himself, and no Jewish people would have come into being, certainly the world of the Jews would have been a radically different place. Humanity might eventually have stumbled upon all Jewish insights, but we cannot be sure. All the great conceptual discoveries of the intellect seem obvious and inescapable once they have been revealed, but it requires a special genius to formulate them for the first time. The Jews have this gift. 
to them we owe the idea of equality before the law, both divine and human, of the sanctity of life and the dignity of the human person, of the individual conscience and so of a personal redemption, of a collective conscience and so of social responsibility of peace as an abstract ideal, and love as the foundation of justice, and many other items which constitute the basic moral furniture of the human mind. Without the Jews, it might have been a much emptier place. Now it's interesting, when you look into all of the different classic Jewish works that we have, ever walk into the yeshiva, you walk into the Lakewood Yeshiva in New Jersey. You walk into Ner Yisrael in Baltimore. And you have this massive study hall with thousands upon thousands of books. If you go through those shelves and try to get a basic little glimpse of what do those books talk about, what percentage discuss the history or the biographies of great Jewish people? If you had to guess. Point zero 0.01 is probably an accurate estimation. It doesn't exist. We don't care. We don't write about these things. Why? So I want to share with you on page two, this is actually from the introduction to a wonderful book called the Rishonin, where it goes through many of the great rabbis of the medieval times. And in the introduction to this work, this is the page two of the intro here, it quotes from the Malbim. The Malbim was one of the great Jewish uh, scholars. He was a commentary on the Tanakh in the 1800s. So he says that it would be unnatural for one who has enjoyed a lavish hospitality of an anonymous person not to be curious of their identity. If you have free lodging and food and you're taken care of beautifully, so there's a natural curiosity, who's doing this for me? Who's giving me all these wonderful things? So he says, although it's true that learning about the people and their lives are not of the utmost importance, and the level of priorities, they're not in the top 10, but there should be this natural curiosity, we're gaining so much wisdom, we're gaining so much guidance and, 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 and life worldview from these great personalities, who were they? In paragraph two, he says, historically, the Torah community did not assign high priority to research into the lives of even its greatest mentors. As the flippant but true Fokidim expresses it, we are more concerned with what Rashi says than with the color of his eyes or the style of his clothes. It is undeniable that rigorous analysis of every nuance and implication of the words of Rashi, Rambam, Ramban, these are all people that we'll get to, God willing, and so on, far outweighs the comparatively trivial study of their lifestyles. That Rashi was a wine merchant and that Rambam was a physician is of infinitely lesser import to the Torah nation than the fact that Rashi was a Godel HaRabbanim. He was one of the greatest of the teachers. And the Rambam was described as the Gedole of one of the greatest of the codifiers, of the authors that we have throughout history. That's much more important. We have much more of an interest in what they accomplished in their ideas and their wisdoms than how they lived their lives or what they ate for breakfast. But at the same time, he says, nothing is more important than the role of a sage as a link in the chain of Torah tradition. If all we know about Rashi is that he lived in France, he sold wine, and he wrote a lot of commentary on the Torah and the Talmud. You can't fully appreciate who Rashi was, and therefore you can't fully appreciate his wisdom or insight into any given topic. To understand how he fits into the global picture, this chain, this, this Masorah, this tradition, going back to Har Sinai, going back to the Mount Sinai experience, passing down this knowledge throughout all the centuries, once you see how they fit in with the global picture, then you can really appreciate where they're coming from and what they're teaching me. So therefore, as we begin this journey, to make it clear, the goal is not to get every nuance of their lives. The goal is to understand where they're coming from, how do they fit into the big picture, 
where were their philosophies developed, and most importantly, what did they say? What was their advice to us? So where do we start? If we're going to start with one great individual in Jewish thinking, who would the first one naturally be? Abraham. Abraham is known as the first Jew. What was the world like in order to get a better picture of his contribution, of his, in Hebrew the term is chiddush, his new insight, his discovery? You have to have a little bit of a glimpse as to what was happening in the world <coughs> leading up to that point in time. Abraham was born in around 1819 BCE, in the beginning of the 19th century BCE. And he was born into a world where superstition and fear dominated. Everyone had many questions, nobody had answers. This is before science, this is before medicine, this is before everything that we know to be ways of getting a basic understanding of life. Nothing was around. So therefore, we have to explain all of the natural phenomena. We have to give reasons and, and fairy tales and mythologies to try to make sense out of the world around us. And that's what people did. And that was the advent of idol worship. Assuming, well, there's many different forces. It rains, and it, there's lightning, and there's thunder, and there's earthquakes, and there's wind, and there. So there must be many different forces in control of all of these elements. And the only way we have a chance of survival is by somehow pacifying them, pleasing them, making them accept our offerings in order to be favorable to us. Now, where did that mindset come from? On one hand, it's very natural. If you're living in a world with many questions and no answers, then you create superstition, mythology, and anything that could explain what you see. But if you go back in time, before this period of Abraham, we do believe, right, we want to avoid the conversation of the age of the universe and the, the uh, first human beings, but we do believe there is a time where human beings had a clarity, had the knowledge of Hashem Echad, of one God. We know Adam and Eve and people after them, Noah. These personalities were well aware that there were not many forces in the universe. There was one infinite, limitless God. What happened? How did somehow that, you know, fall into this downward cycle of worshiping idols? How do you lose that clarity? How do you lose that, that, that sense of reality? So Maimonides shares with us a very profound essay. We're going to mention Maimonides a lot. We're not going to actually get to him as a, a one of our personalities for a while, but we do quote him often. Maimonides explains the progression or the evolution of idol worship. The reason why it's relevant to us is because it's not something that took place 3,800 years ago, but it's a continuous cycle that we see happening over many centuries, including our own time, in different shapes, in different forms, in different flavors, but it's the same cycle, which is, explains Maimonides as follows. There's a clarity of one God, and that was true with the first human beings. What do you do with that? I can't touch him, I can't see him, I can't smell him, I can't have a conversation with him. So, we look around the world and we see, well listen, there are other major forces out there that although God's in control, but there are other things at play. Just like a king who has many noblemen, it's only an honor to the king to honor those people who are close to the king. So these are things that are more tangible. We see the sun, we see the moon, we see the stars. Let's worship these entities, not because we believe they're an end unto themselves because they have independent power, but let's worship them as a way of giving praise and honor to the infinite. Okay, not a terrible idea. And that's what happened. 
But can you maintain that level of focus for generations? The answer is no. What happens is, is over time, if we're bowing down to the sun and we're offering sacrifices to the moon and we're singing songs of praise to the stars, so then that turns into the sun and the moon are independent forces that somehow control what happens here on earth. And it's easy to lose sight of the infinite creator. So then humankind begins worshipping the different elements and powers in nature. Now the reason they were able to do that was not because they were super primitive or barbaric. But we believe that as culture has developed and as technology only advances, in a sense, we really lose touch with nature. We no longer live in nature. We live in a world that's totally isolated, that's totally um, sealed off from the world around us. We live in an artificially created, man-made structure. Thousands of years ago, before buildings, before cars, <coughs> before anything that was a separation between us and the world, they were much more in tune with the forces in nature. And because of their greater sensitivity, they had more of a reverence for the forces within nature. And therefore, they worshipped with those forces. Initially, it was as a way of praising God, but that quickly led into worshipping them because we think somehow they could help us. The next step explains by monody is, is once you worship the sun and the moon, you want something more tangible. So you create a statue of the sun or a statue of the moon. And you build a temple, and people can gather there. Something that we can see, that we can touch. And you worship that statue, not because you think anything comes from that statue. That's ridiculous. But I'm worshiping it as a way of that image, focusing on that picture, trying to really connect me to something greater than the statue itself. And that lasts for a couple generations, but then that slowly declines into we worship the statue. Somehow we're getting our crop from this piece of stone. Somehow we're getting the rain from this carved out wood. That's the progression of Avodah Zorah, otherwise known as idol worship. So we have Abraham who's born into this world of idol worship, into a world where there are many different forces. And the Maimonides explains that that's how he was born and raised. He went to temple with his father. His father, we know from Midrashic literature, was one of the priests in one of the, the pagan cults that were around those times. He went to temple every, whatever it was, Friday or Sunday, whenever they had their services, or every day. He bowed down to the statues. But the one thing that Abraham had was a curiosity. He was curious. And as he grew to be a little bit older, he kept on asking questions, and he wasn't really getting sufficient answers. And the more he would ask, the more he would probe, the more he realized people don't really have the answers. And there are different interpretations as to what point in his life did he arrive at this conclusion, at this discovery, that indeed there are not many forces, but there's only one ultimate, limit, limitless, infinite force that controls everything. When did that happen? There are different uh, opinions. Some say he was in his 40s, some say he was 52. Some say he began his journey, his intellectual pursuits at the age of three. Whatever it was, it was clear that he was a very curious, very original thinker. That led him to the conclusion, there's one God and the world around me is mistaken. Now, what do you do with that information? You write a book, you can write an essay and publish it. He didn't do that. He was so convinced that he knew there was one God and everyone else was mistaken that he felt that it was his mission in life to teach the world that they're wrong and to show them the light, to show them the truth of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, the truth of one God. And it's because we all know this, if you were to ask your average Jew living today, what was the main contribution of Abraham, they would tell you monotheism. 
he discovered the reality of one God. Do you agree with that statement? Most people probably answer that. I'll tell you why it's true, but it's not entirely accurate. There's much more to Abraham than discovering Hashem Echad. The proof to that is, as we mentioned, that there are other people throughout history who also had that knowledge. Noah knew there was one God. He wasn't chosen to be the first Jew. Shem and Aver, other great people before Abraham, knew that there was one God. They weren't chosen to be the first Jews. What was special about Abraham's discovery? So I'll show you a couple of ideas. If you are telling me, Mr. Abraham, that we're all wrong, and you believe there's only one source for everything, therefore what? Does it make so much of a difference? You believe in many gods, I believe in one god. Who cares? The difference was the therefore in what it means to be human. If you come from the approach that there are many gods and many different controllers, and our job is really to pacify them and, and make them happy with me, just in, able to, in, in, in order to live, so then the view of the human being is basically we're a bunch of, of, a bunch of, of subjugated, lowly animals trying to somehow pacify all of these different forces. And the analogy would be, tomorrow morning, aliens come, and they take over planet Earth, and we know we have no chance to beat them. We could bring out everything we have, all the nuclear missiles. There's no way we could touch these aliens. So what happens is there's a, a feeling of despair, of hopelessness. Fine. We accept the reality that we will be subjugated to this new alien race, and that's what life is. That was the, the, the life, that was the world in primitive times. We assumed that we were subjugated lowly beings to this alien race who is in control of us. And why did they create us in the first place? To serve them, because they need us. When Abraham comes along and he says, no, there are not many forces, there is one limitless, infinite God. So what does that tell you about yourself? One second. If God is infinite, which means you lack nothing, which means you need nothing, so then, by definition, the reason for creation is not to use us as pawns, is not to make us serve you so you'll gain from us. You don't need us. So why did you create us? And this is where the radical insight of Abraham comes into play. His insight was, because I believe in one all-powerful, infinite source of life, it's because of that human beings must have been created out of love. Not in order to give the deity something that he or she needs, but rather we're created as a gift. Life is a gift. We're created in the image of God. We ourselves are godly. It's a whole different view of the human being. It's a whole different responsibility. <clears throat> we're not subjugated to serve these forces because they need us. We're created to live here as human beings out of love and out of pleasure, to gain from the limitless God. So it was not just a discovery in regards to his view of God, it was changing radically the whole perspective on what it meant to be human. Now, were his ideas accepted? Were people quick to say, oh, that sounds good. I like that idea, Abraham. I'll join you. So on one hand, he was very successful. Maimonides again tells us that in the times of Abraham, he was able to teach many people. He gathered tens of thousands of followers, people to join his, his monotheistic view of the world. At the same time, we're told in Midrashic literature that people would make fun of him. They would berate him. They would call him names. Now that's something that's interesting. Why would they make fun of the guy? Is it true that he's preaching something that was totally different than everybody else? The answer is yes. What do you do 
when you see someone who's preaching something that's totally different than everybody else. You're walking down in midtown Manhattan, and the guy is standing there in the soapbox, and he's telling you you're all condemned to go to hell if you don't do X, Y, and Z. So do you see everyone running over to him and saying, no, we're not, that's, that's foolish. What are you saying? Prove it to me. Why don't you do that? Because I have more important things to do. I have more important things to do. I want to get a coffee. I have to get to work. There's probably many, many things I'd rather do than have a conversation with this lunatic. Why was it different 30, 100 years ago? Why was it that all of those people who didn't accept the teachings of Abraham had this need to fight, to, to tell him he was wrong, to ridicule him? Where did that need come from? Is right. And this is a, a tremendous insight of the human nature, which is whenever you find someone arguing tooth and nail against something, oftentimes it's because deep down I believe what you're saying is true. And I'm not doing that. And therefore I have to get defensive. If what he's saying is true and his lifestyle is, is different than mine, then I have, to, I have to find some way, at least in my own head, to say, meh, he's just, he's just crazy. And that's why they had that need to make fun of Abraham. Interesting. Oftentimes you'll see, I'm always fascinated by this, outspoken atheists. Hitchens or Dawkins or whoever is out there writing books and trying to convince the masses that there is no God. And I always have that question, which is, I understand if you're a religious Christian and you feel that your mission in life is to convert other people, I might have a different view of, of, of reality, but I understand where you're coming from. You feel that your belief system is the only way to do it, and if I don't believe what you believe, I'm condemned to hell, you want to save me. Thank you. It's very noble of you. I get that. But if you feel that there is no purpose, there is no God, everything is random, it doesn't make a difference what you do or what you think, so why do you have that need to try to convince me that I'm wrong? Where does that come from? Why are you writing books? And I think the answer is because on some level, they have to fight it because they're not convinced themselves. Whenever there's a fight against something, and I see this within, within teaching, you'll have people, sometimes in a lecture, who are very new to Judaism. And they're very argumentative sometimes, and everything you say, the little question, sometimes that means they just have no interest, and that's okay, but sometimes, because they're so aggressive, that's a wonderful indication that there's something, something going on within them. There's a struggle. There's a fire there. And sometimes it's really those people who grow the most. It's the person sitting in the back of the lecture who's just smiling and nodding. They might not grow that much. When you see there's a fight, when you see people are, are trying to argue with you, it could be because they know deep down what you're saying is correct. And they think that was the case in regards to Abraham. Point well, you know, I was just going to say that you know, perhaps maybe that's why we've, we've been mocked so much by the nations throughout the time. Because at the end of the day, they just know we're right. It's a very profound statement. Chafetz Chaim was one of the great personalities of the early 20th century. He said, you'll never find real uh, vicious hatred that doesn't stem from jealousy. The more vicious the hatred, right, the, the more profound those feelings are, that means there has to be some level of jealousy there. That's a very good point. So, but to understand the contribution of Abraham, we don't have any of the works that he wrote, so there were, we can't look at those together, but to understand that number one, it was the discovery of monotheism, but even more important than that, it was the discovery of the human being the sanctity, the dignity of a human being, and the fact that we're not created to serve others, we're created out of love for ourselves as a gift. Now what he did, which was really somewhat shocking, is besides the academic pursuit of discovering God 
and having a new view of what it means to be human. He tried to emulate God. He tried to live his life through copying, through, through trying to, to do the same things that God does. Now, how in the world do you do that? How do you copy God? We don't see what he does. At the same time, though, we can all attest to the fact that human nature is such that when you see something that's so moving and that's so brilliant, there's something within you that, I want to do it also. I remember when I was younger, I used to play soccer. And one time we went back to the coach's house, and he showed us some old movies of Pele. And I was blown away. But what, what did I do with that enthusiasm? As soon as I was watching it for 20 minutes, half an hour, I wanted to get back outside with the soccer ball and try doing one of those behind the back kicks. I was never successful. But that's, that's how we react. When you see something beautiful, I want to do it also. That was the response of Abraham. He saw the kindness in creation. He looked around the world and he said, human beings are here, animals are here, there's food, there's sustenance. There's so much good, there's so much love. Clearly, God is kind. At the same time, you have questions. Not everything is, is smooth in life. And some people are lacking nourishment, and some people are lacking uh, water. But the world as a creation is such that you have beings with needs, and you also have things that could sustain those needs and take care of people and animals. So Abraham was not just a desert wanderer, but he was a master at meditation, at introspection. He was a thinker. And it was the thinking and the curiosity that led him to the discoveries of one God, the discoveries of the sanctity of the human being, and the discovery or that feeling of need to emulate the infinite. And that's what he did. I want to share with you. Is that similar to um, like Aristotle or philosophers? Or... In what way? Being similar in the way where? The thinkers. The thinkers. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We definitely share that common thread. I think the main thing that really set Abraham apart as a very unique person was what he did with that information. It wasn't merely an academic pursuit. Philosophy oftentimes is interesting, but it's just philosophy. I, I quote this often, but I think it's a great example. Bertrand Russell, a great mathematician and philosopher, and, uh, yet he was known for doing things that are very immoral. There's one particular time that he came into class after being involved with something that everyone heard about. He walks in, and one of the, the girls in the front has the, the chutzpah to raise her hand and says, excuse me, professor, I just don't get it. Here you are teaching us philosophy, ethical living, morals, but yet you're behaving like this. How do you explain that? And his response was, and if I taught geometry, would I have to be a triangle? <laughs> this is what I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you philosophy. That's oftentimes what philosophy turns into. It's an interesting uh, pursuit. It doesn't change my life. Abraham was unique in the sense that he took this information, it changed him, and he wanted to change others. And so that's really where the last component comes into play, which was the feeling of responsibility. The feeling that not only do I feel that I have the truth, but I have a, 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 this sense of, of obligation and responsibility to share that truth with others. Yes? Did God put these thoughts in Abraham's head? It's a good question, but the answer is no. It's clear from the sources that there was no divine intervention. God never came to him and said, Abraham, there's only one God. Everyone's wrong. It didn't happen like that. It was based on curiosity, it was based on being a thinker, it was based on not accepting the norm, being able to fight against what most people thought to be true, which is very difficult. 
the famous line of the Torah that Abraham is referred to as Avram HaIvri. Now, literally, HaIvri, which is why they were called Hebrews. Right? It means from the other side of the Euphrates. But Midrashic literature teaches us that he was referred to as Avraham HaIvri, not just in a geographical sense, but in a psychological sense. He was on one side of the river, and everyone else, the whole entire world, was on the other side. He was standing alone. But he was stubborn. And you see the genetics. We are a stubborn people. The Torah refers to the Jewish nation as Am Kishay Orif, a stubborn nation. And that might be a negative, but it's also positive. It might be part of the reason why we're alive and well and vibrant 3,800 years later. Abraham was stubborn. He was stubborn to stand up for what he believed to be true. So you kind of come full circle now. So Jews are basically the kid in the class who keeps arguing with the rabbi. The kids in the class who keeps arguing. The well, kid in the class who keeps arguing, who keeps, uh, you know, the conversation lively instead of just, you know, smiling. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It depends where it's coming from. Abraham wasn't arguing with everyone around him just for the sake of arguing, just for being that. I'm talking about Jews as a stiff-necked people. Jews all together being that kid. Well, we have that character trait. Right. You know, the question is, how do we utilize it? So if we use it just to be that annoying kid in the class who always has to say something different than the teacher, that's one way. <laughs> if we utilize it to stand up for what we believe to be true, and even if that means, and, and many of the philosophies that we'll touch upon throughout this series, and we'll see there's so many different angles, so many different nuanced perspectives, but many of the great breakthroughs of the Jewish personalities were totally against the grain whether in science, whether in religion, philosophy, totally against the grain of what was viewed as normative thinking of their times. So this character trait really manifests itself throughout all the centuries. You know, if you think of the evangelical Christians, and like you were saying, you go to hell, you know, believe in change, yet they also believe that the Jews are the chosen people. Now, maybe for a reason that is, you know, for a different motive, but that goes back to what you're saying is that maybe people are thinking they got something and they're right, but you know, that's it's a very insightful point. If very you look at the descendants of Abraham, you know, in regards to Western religions, Christianity and Islam, and they all believe in Jewish people who were chosen, they received the Torah and Mount Sinai. And then they have different stories as to what happened along the way. Right. Did God choose Jesus? Did he choose Muhammad? Was there something else that took place? But everyone buys into that, that first part. And you're right. Why does everyone agree? Make up your own story. I think part of it is people realize there's truth here. What we do with that realization, though, is really a big question. Sometimes that could be the source of, of jealousy which fuels hatred. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be the source of love that fuels compassion. It all depends how we use it. But if you really just put yourself in his shoes for a moment, would you have the courage to do what he did? Many of us are aware of the, the Midrash that explains his father had an idol shop, and one day his dad said, I'm going out to lunch. Can you watch the idols while I'm away? And he said, sure, Pops. His dad goes out. Well, he's gone. He takes a big hammer and he smashes all the idols, and then he places it in the biggest idol's hand. His father comes back. Abraham, what did you do? I told you to watch the shop. And his response is, I did, but the big idol smashed all the little ones. And his father said, oh, okay. No. His dad was outrageous. What are we talking about? That's crazy. This idol can't break other idols. It's a piece of stone. And Abraham's response was, being the classic Jew, ah, it's a piece of stone. So why are you worshiping this then? He was a chutzpah yak. He had audacity. He was able to speak up. He was put in jail for 10 years because of that chutzpah. People don't know that. He was in jail for 10 years. And at what point in time did God ever come to him and say, you're doing great, buddy doing great. You're on the right track. <coughs> Keep on going. I'm with you. 
when he was 60 years old, after 60 years of meditation, introspection, coming to that clarity, sharing it with the world, did he have any outside reinforcement? No. No. The first time that God has any communication with Abraham is when Abraham is 75 years old. Until that point, God never said boo. He didn't say boo. I think the answer is So, before the answer, let's be Jewish here. Let's phrase it in a different way. We'll ask another question. Why did Abraham have to discover this on his own? This whole process, really distancing himself from his parents and his family, being an outcast, being made fun of, why does God make him go through it? God should have came to Abraham at 13 years old. Now you're bar mitzvah. I want to share with you birds and the bees. There's one God, everyone here is wrong. Why put him through so much suffering? You appreciate it yeah. when you figure it out. You appreciate it that much more when it comes from yourself, and it's that much more real. Anything that comes from within, that's you. That's your discovery. Anything that comes from without, even if it's coming from the source of all creation, it's coming from the infinite creator of the universe. But that didn't come from within me. God was not there to tell any particular individual, let me clue you into reality, this is what's really going on. There was almost this sense of, I'm waiting, I'm stepping back. We'll see who comes to it on their own. That was Abraham. Only once he achieved greatness, to the extent where he had a mastery in philosophy, in his worldview, in his, his understanding of spirituality, in sharing that with the masses, but then at 75 years old, God felt he was ready to take it to the next level. And that's when he approaches Abraham and says, Lech Lecha, go from your land. It's time for phase two of your mission. But it's an amazing level of courage. You have never gotten the green light. No one ever came to you and said, what you were doing is okay. But he kept on going. How did God come to him? That's a good question. Now, whenever the Torah speaks about God communicating with the human being, it always says an expression of speech. If you've seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, usually God has a very deep voice. <laughs> but that's not really what happens. The, the prophecy is something that is very hard for us to relate to. Because we can't picture any form of real communication without hearing someone's voice, without seeing someone, without feeling something, even if a person, God forbid, is blind, but there are ways of communicating through touch, through feel. The person is deaf, you can use sign language. But the idea of, of getting some level of, of instruction in a whole different realm, a whole different dimension, is something we can't even imagine. Maimonides, again, he says, when he describes the experience of prophecy, he says it was so overwhelming that the, the person receiving the prophecy had to be asleep or unconscious. To receive prophecy, to get that level of infusion of sanctity when you were awake and conscious, you probably die. There's only one man in history who was able to receive prophecy while fully awake, and that man was? Moses. Moses. And we'll get to him. Abraham was not on that level of prophecy. But just to review, his contributions were monotheism that we all know. But more than monotheism, it was a radical redefinition of the sanctity and the dignity of the human being and the purpose of creation. Number three, it was a, a stubbornness, a willingness to stand up and fight for what you believe in, although you have no one on your team. Number four was a sense of responsibility feeling that if I know this to be true, I have to share it with others, I have to teach the world. Now one could ask the question number four. That sounds very much like the, huh? Yeah. To missionize, to go out and try to convert people. Right? And we know that's not really a Jewish philosophy. So why did Abraham do that? So, basic answer is in a nutshell, 
at that point in time, that was the mission. The mission was spread truth to the world. Once we have the creation of the Jewish people, and, and their goal is to be that light onto the nations, so then, in order to maintain that, that unit of Am Yisrael, the Jewish nation, then there has to be this feeling of, if other people want to enter, that's fine, but they have to be real, they have to be authentic. We can't have people coming into this unit and watering things down. That's where the notion of not really encouraging conversion comes from. But at the beginning stages, what's referred to in Kabbalistic literature as the planting of the seeds, at that point in history, that was the goal. Teach others, bring them under the, the wings of the Shekhinah, the wings of the Divine Presence. Is he the only one that had that mission? Or was it spread to other people? How, how, how did he accomplish the spreading of that mission? Good question. He, was, he lived a nomadic life. He lived traveling from place to place, teaching people about the reality of God. Now, he wasn't alone in this mission. The only way it was possible was with his life's partner, Sarah. And they worked together as a team. We have sources that tell us that Abraham converted the men, and Sarah converted the women, and together they were very successful. Like Maimonides told us, tens of thousands of people, by the time Abraham passed away, there were tens of thousands of people that he influenced. So, what, what's con confusing to me is nothing ever happened with these people, because the Jewish people didn't come from them. So, um, technically, it was irrelevant. It seems like the, you know, like a, you know, when I see it, it was irrelevant that he did all this, because the Jewish people came from, you know, his son, not from these people. Nothing ever happened. There's no nation today that claims to be the descendants of Abraham's converts. It's a good question. Whatever happened to those tens of thousands of people that he influenced? So we're told that they didn't stick with it. They were inspired, they were part of it for a time, but then they all kind of fell out. So what's the point? I think the answer is, number one, you saw that he had that feeling of responsibility. Even if he wasn't successful in keeping these people in his group, but that sense of I have to share with the world was there. That made him special and unique. But I think the second thing is, even if they didn't stay within the fold, they weren't part of the, the future of the Jewish people, those ideas are out there now. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's a similar thing in, in Jewish outreach. You might have a group of many people you're learning with for a couple of years, and then some go their own way, their own direction, and they don't want to necessarily stay so connected. But they have the concepts, and they can spread. Yeah. But if, if God... Um, controls the world. Why didn't, he, why didn't these people stick with it? Why didn't he make them? He made us. Why didn't he create them to do that? And why hasn't he helped more if if he is the only one God, which I believe in, but why hasn't he um, done more so with all the other religions and made, made the people see that this is true, if it's true? Good question. It's similar to your question with why didn't God just tell Abraham this is... And tell the rest of the world. Why doesn't God just world? tell us? Oh. And come to everyone if he wants, if this is the truth, God's truth. Why isn't he spreading the word? So the answer, I think, is twofold. Right? That number one is, it happened. And, and that moment in time was Mount Sinai. And we'll get there when we speak about Moses and the giving of the Torah. So there was that moment in time where it was made clear to the entire world, this is who I am, this is what I want from you. But it sounds like why did he do that initially? Right. Because the beginning of the journey had to come from within. There was a need for a human being to discover this on his own. God was not going to force it upon anybody. Mankind had to come to this knowledge and wisdom through their own searching, through their own curiosity. That's what Abraham did. But one person, only one person. And you should know, that is a very common theme throughout all of history. The greatest discoveries, the greatest inventions, 
the greatest feats often come from one person. One person can change the world. And I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but why hasn't God continued this thought for the rest of the world? Continuing so after the Ten Commandments, why hasn't he brought more prophecies? So that, I think we're going to have to say, that's a very good question as well. If prophecy did exist thousands of years ago, Where? there were communications, there Where? were you know, conversations with God, why did those stop? And we're going to get there when we discuss the, the destruction of the first temple, which won't be for a couple of weeks, but we'll get there. The, all very insightful points. But at least in these very beginning stages of history, the goal was to arrive uh, to this information on your own. That's what Abraham did. The contributions are endless. I want to share with you one last point here. Very last page of this book, but then I recommend take these home, read through the material, some wonderful sources here just to get a fuller picture of, of who he was, when he lived, a deeper understanding of his thought patterns. In Article 32, this is written by Rabbi Victor Miller, one of the great rabbis of our times. Page 5. Paragraph 32. Unlike the culture of the nations, Israel's history did not show a gradual development. There was no long, drawn-out struggle upward from idolatry to monotheism. The sun of Judaism appeared suddenly on the horizon, and it swiftly rose to its zenith. In contrast to what some secular historians might claim, that monotheism was a very slow evolution. The Torah perspective is not like that. The Torah perspective is there was one man, Abraham, living in a world of illusion, living in a world where there were different forces and superstitions and there was no oneness. And it was his discovery. It wasn't immediate. It took himself years and years of inner struggle and turmoil. But when he came upon this realization that there's one God and all of the, the ramifications of that belief, it was the sun rising. It wasn't a gradual, slow process. We'll share together the last point, which is the very bottom of page 5, verse number 19. This is God telling us in the Torah why he loves Abraham. For I have loved him because he commands his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of Hashem, doing charity and justice, in order that Hashem might then bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. The Torah is not saying, I love Abraham because he discovered monotheism. The Torah is saying, I love Abraham because what he did with that realization. He took it and he did something meaningful. He shares it with others. I love him because he commands his children and his household after him. He instructs them to do what? Charity and justice. That was the essence of Abraham. Not just the philosopher, not just the meditator, but a curious, intellectually stimulated person who discovered brilliant ideas, but then put them into practice. It was theory that he transformed into action. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change others as well. And God says, that's why I love you. And we know that the covenant was created between God and Abraham. God tells Abraham, you will be the father of an eternal nation. Your descendants will be a very special and cherished people. And through you, the world will be blessed. So the prophecy of Isaiah that we started with, that the role of the Jewish nation is to be a light onto the world, not to isolate ourselves, not to despair and, and feel hopelessness about the world, but to be that engine, to be that motor that inspires the world. And that starts with Abraham and his discoveries. And God says, because you have this mission, I'm with you, and we have this promise. OK. Christianity and Islam. They both accept that he was a wonderful prophet that God communicated with.
might have different stories in regards to what happened afterwards.